I'm very pleased to introduce our first two speakers in this session, Kirk Siegler, who is a correspondent on NPR's National Desk. Uh, he's based in the network's West Coast Bureau in Los Angeles. His reporting focuses on the urban-rural divide. He has gone from a small timber town in Idaho to reporting on Clive and Bundy's Nevada ranch, where he landed a rare interview with the recalcitrant rancher after the arms standoff in Paradise, California. So he's been reporting from, uh, from there as well due to the deadly campfire in 2018. So I'm very happy to have Kirk hosting a conversation with Hillary Franz. Hillary, this is our third year at the Sun Valley Forum. We're very grateful to have her back with us. Hillary's the commissioner, Washington State's commissioner of public lands. She will tell you more about that, but she is really pioneering rural resilience through the leadership in managing Washington State's vast land and other public assets for beneficial use. She is a third generation uh, farming family, small forest landholder and so therefore comes to this rural resilience strategy through her history and her family. She's also a Smith graduate, very as a Smithy, and also a recovering lawyer like I am from Northeastern University Law School. With that, Hillary and Kirk, please join us on stage. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody. Morning. I love that I match the seats <laughs> out there. <laughs> right, right. Um, so thanks for being here. Uh, it's great to be here in Sun Valley. Uh, thanks for the introductions. Um, we were actually just talking backstage. It's a little unique to have your position as public lands commissioner for the state of Washington as elected. Uh, sometimes these are appointed positions by the governor, but do you want to start by giving us a sense for what you do? In that yeah, role? this is great. There's actually only 16 commissioner public lands in the nation, actually, um, that are elected. I'm a statewide elected in Washington State, with, and I oversee 1,600 people and about technically six agencies in one. So one, I oversee the state's wildfire fighting. Um, which we are seeing more significant wildfires every single year. I also oversee the second amount, largest amount of recreation land in Washington State, second to the federal government. Then I oversee the Washington State geology. So think in Washington State, we have five live volcanoes, the threat of the Berg earthquake, threat of tsunamis, landslides. It is not a slow day at the office in any stretch of the imagination. And then also I oversee 2.6 million acres of aquatic land. So think the entire coast of Washington State, the Puget Sound, all our lakes, rivers, and streams, overseeing management from ports, marinas, shellfish, gooey duck. Um, in addition to that, I oversee 3 million acres of upland. So oversee 2 million acres of timber conservation land, a million acres of agricultural land. We're the largest wheat grower now in Washington State. We're becoming the largest vineyard grower. My goal is, uh, thanks to the forum here and the work we're doing uh, with Sun Valley Institute, is to become the largest renewable energy producer in Washington State. In addition to that, I have about 40,000 acres of commercial industrial property. So how many people have been to the Edgewater in Washington State where the Beatles were, right? So I hire a hotel management company to run that. Super simple job, no pressure, right? No pressure, we're really, uh, yes, exactly. So uh, you mentioned wildfires, um, that's always in the news. Um, and this is, a, this is a discussion about rural resiliency, but Washington State in particular, uh, NPR, we've been covering uh, wildfires in parts of Washington that we didn't before. Um, the environment is quite uh, fast changing, and I wonder if you might talk about the work you're doing to address some of those concerns on the ground in communities who are right on the front lines of climate change and other factors fueling these fires like we've never seen before, at least in modern history. Yeah, so it, it's the landscape in Washington State when it comes to fires changing dramatically. Over the last five years, we've seen a rapid increase in the number of fires. Um, last year, we had 1,850 wildfires total in the state, most ever on record. We had um, over 40% of those west of the Cascades, which is unprecedented, where we were having fires actually in the Olympic rainforest. Um, we are spending total 153 million a year to fight those fires and react, um, and it's only getting worse. Uh, this last this year, we had at times um, we thought we were going to have the worst wildfires in the nation. Fortunately, July brought us a lot of rain, which we were grateful for, which is, um, but we see changing conditions in the environment. 
Part of the reason we're having more catastrophic wildfires is we have 2.7 million acres of forest in central and eastern Washington alone that are dead and diseased. Um, and it's leading to technically just a ticking time bomb. All it takes is one spark, and what might have been a fire that was only 100 plus acres historically is now hundreds of thousands of acres. We know that a lot of these communities who are on the front line um, of these fires are also on the front line of very fragile economy. Many of them have seen 9 to 12% unemployment generation after generation, even as Seattle's experiencing third year in a row with the most cranes in the nation. And so what we've been trying to do is actually get at the issue not only from the environmental crisis and the fragileness of that environment, of the forest health and wildfires, but also look at it from a context of how do we address the fragileness of those local economies. And so what we've done is we've developed a 20-year forest health plan in 2017 that has us treating 1.25 million acres of forest over the next 20 years. And these are national forests, state forests, local? It is all. Everything. So okay. uh, as fire and disease don't follow any jurisdictional boundary lines, nor should we in us getting at the root of the problem. And so in 2017, I signed a, an agreement with the U.S. Forest Service that enables us now to do forest health treatment and even salmon habitat restoration and recreation activities on federal lands. Since we already have boots on the ground, we have more ability to be more efficient, greater economies of scale. Let's do the work. Um, and in doing that, when we set out and said we're going to treat 70,000 acres a year um, for the next 20 years, we sent a message to the marketplace in Washington State. We said if you're interested in coming in and investing in cross laminate timber and mass timber, which is the most sustainable building product we can build, come here to Washington State. And literally within one year, we now have just this month cross laminate timber manufacturing facility opening up in the northeast region of Washington State in Colville, which has been one of our most challenged economically rural communities. Well, when you, when you visit communities like that, uh, be they in Washington or Idaho, I know it's been my experience visiting uh, timber towns and former timber towns. A, there's a lot of tension, right? Because uh, a lot of those industries have dried up. I guess my question would be, or, or are starting to dry up due to mechanization, due to imports from Canada, due to tougher environmental policies, the gamut. Uh, my question, I guess, is, is that a barrier standing in your way uh, infrastructure? You know, are the mills still there? Uh, do they need to be retrofitted? Is there a market for this smaller diameter wood that everybody agrees is the main fire risk, not the big expensive trees that the industry traditionally wanted? Part of the reason we have a forest health crisis is because we have mills that have shut down in those key areas of central and eastern Washington um, where it costs too much for us to do those forest health treatments because of transportation costs, right? So it doesn't actually pay for itself. Mm -hmm. um, part of what we're looking at is how do we get smaller diameter um, mills that are also movable so that we can be moving the projects and the mills at the same time or at least getting them more centralized. Um, I think one of the biggest things for me when I came into this role in 2017, right, I was elected in 2016 where we saw nationally and statewide this very significant statement between the urban-rural divide, between the growing context that it feels like we have an environment versus economy debate. Mm -hmm. And the fact that if we didn't really dive into that at the community level to start to address that division, we will fail not only our those people in those communities that we've been failing, but we will also fail the environment, we will fail our urban communities, right? So the way we've been tackling that um, is actually going into the communities. And I went out to the communities across the state, eastern and western, most rural communities, and I said, look, we believe we have a role in helping grow your economy and that for too long, generation after generation, you've been forgotten and abandoned. Um, and that the way we're going to do that is by being intentional. And what we bring to this is land. We bring land, and we know that land creates economic opportunity. It also creates environmental sustainability. Um, and in six months, we got 88 projects from every corner of the state. We have now over 150, where um, as a result of that work, we are helping reopen a mill. We're now growing some of the next Napa Valley of Washington State, where historically we were getting $0 an acre for agricultural land that was getting gobbled up by subdivision after subdivision that we now have planted in grapes for 50 years, leases that'll generate $1,100 an acre for that local community. 
Um, and in addition to that, we got project after project where we're showing that the environment and economy don't have to be at odds. So you're, you're, you're speaking in particular Colville, Washington, uh, in a part of Washington where a lot of folks, as you know, talk about the Cascade Curtain. In fact, some people want to create their own state. Not unlike other places we've seen in Northern California, the state of Jefferson proposal, which has been around for decades, this is kind of bubbling back up again. So I wonder when you travel into a place like that, uh, do you encounter, um, and I shouldn't say travel into, I mean, we're all living in the same state in the same communities, but do you encounter still resistance as somebody who may be perceived anyway, whether it's legitimate or not, as someone from the other side of the Cascade Curtain, an environmentalist, urban person who doesn't understand our way of life out here? I would say absolutely at first. But it wasn't when I got there. It was before I got there. It's when I went into the community and I said, help me understand your biggest challenge. So a perfect example is um, the wildfire forest health issue. When I came into this position, I didn't have a lot of knowledge and information about that particular issue. And I hadn't, my community where I live hadn't been threatened by wildfire and forest health. So I went and spent an entire day um, with one of uh, the leaders from that community as well as uh, people on the ground. And they showed me with my own eye, you know, showed me with their sort of this context of here's how a fire came ripping through a canyon that had been untreated. Dead, dying disease trees left on the ground, smaller diameter was clogged. And then how the fire laid itself down by itself at a treated managed forest. Mm -hmm. And I mean treated managed, that means forest health treatment. I don't mean logged, right? I mean a treated where um, they've really gone in and made that forest more resilient and brought prescribed fire in. And when I saw that with my eyes, I said, I will go work to make sure we get the resources and make this one of our number one focus so that we are not always year after year reacting, but coming at it from a proactive way. Um, and since then, we've been able to not only adopt that plan, but also now secure over $50 million to do that work. And so that's the first thing. The mm -hmm. second thing is that same community faced flood. Worst flood since 1973, last April and May. And snow melt, the snow from Canada melted so fast, it flooded every single town across, along the Okanagan River. And these are communities that have limited resource and capacity. State of emergency declared, and no one came. So I got a call, and he said, Hillary, can you please do something? I said, I will send 300 firefighters tomorrow to fill sandbags. There's a real feeling of kind of they're not listening to us out in those communities. They feel right? abandoned. Mm -hmm. Not only do you go in those communities, their buildings are abandoned, right? The streets are abandoned. And they shops, see. And they feel abandoned and they feel ignored by the people who are in power within the legislature or in state government, right? Um, and oftentimes they are disenfranchised. And you could go back generations. Um, and I think it's our responsibility, our first role is to say, you matter. I don't care where you live, I don't care how you vote, you matter and have equal value to anybody else. And then say, but I don't know how to help, but I want to help. And you show up and you listen and you learn and then you go work with them to champion it. They see them, in some communities like that, they see themselves as being left behind from the boom in Seattle and San Francisco, but in part responsible for helping make that boom happen, right? With natural resource-based economies. That's right, we they, depend on those. We depend, they're our food source, a lot of them are our water source, and obviously they're our building supply source. And they feel like all the opportunity has shifted into certain regions and they've gotten all the benefit of that and none of it has returned to them. But I think it's important, and this is one of the most important tellings for me and what really it leads me in the work I do and the commitment at the sort of the total heart level, not just the hard work level. Many of our communities, the timber towns on the coast, let's use that as an example, and you could play that across the nation in any other state, but the timber towns, if you go back to before the Spotted Owl, which was our sort of big environmental decision, regulation that, if you went back to the moment that decision was made, right, you had people, kids who went to school the next day, sixth graders, and they knew whose parent, dads actually and parents had jobs and who didn't. It was that dramatic overnight, where overnight that community was, saw unemployment, therefore then the shops closed, the mills closed, and it was a ripple effect of downturn. And then what you saw after that is homelessness, mental health, depression, right? And they have had that for 
generations now. It's almost ingrained into like local lore. I was just in Escalante, Utah, mm -hmm. uh, talking uh, about a different public land story, and um, the spotted owl was blamed for the timber mill shutting down. And I thought, hmm, was, was there a spotted owl in Utah? <laughs> but it's almost of lore. And, and, and here's what I would just say. It doesn't mean that that policy shouldn't have happened. That's not what's been. What should have happened is when that policy is coming down. It should have been a plan, right? It should have been. Look, we know this is going to dramatically impact. Their, we fund their operating budget with our timber that we do. Our, we used to be 80% of those communities' operating budgets. So we're talking about health, housing, human services, transportation, public safety. Overnight, we moved to 40% of their operating budget. And there was no backfill, right? What should have happened is everybody should say, look, this policy is going to come down, and it is going to have an economic, social, and environmental impact on your community. How do we work with you to now create a diversified economic base that you are actually ensuring your long-term social, economic, and environmental well-being? Is this one of the big barriers in front of uh, the transition to coal in other places too, right? You, coal miners want jobs, but they also want if we're going to transition, they want a plan. That was that sort of famous, uh, I guess if you're a Democrat, infamous quote by Hillary Clinton that some say doomed her, but we didn't play the rest of the quote, which said retrain. That's right. <laughs> it's a perfect example. We need that just transition. We need, but, and oftentimes there's this context of the decision being made by somebody outside of that community versus if the community was able to own and be part of that decision making and their long-term outcome and people came in to provide support capital finance investment strategic thinking right w one quick question before we get to the panel because we're running out of time unfortunately uh, that i have uh, is uh, challenges to getting that you have a very ambitious project you're you're hitting your targets in terms of forest treatment you've got a mill open already or reopened in colville another one you mentioned in vancouver just across the river from portland um, how big of a hurdle is labor for you? Is this workforce still around? Is it, does it have to be wholly retrained in some of these communities, as we've said, uh, which have seen the industry go away? So even before we had launched this plan, we were already struggling to fill natural resource positions within our own agency, as well as I know even private companies that are in natural resource or we're having struggles. So one of the things we've been doing is realizing we have to also play a part in the training and education of the next natural resource experts. Um, and so we've actually launched a program with a high school actually, where we are now teaching on the ground with that high school um, active learning of how to do sustainable forest management. Our hope is to launch that into a larger effort around sustainable agriculture management. How do we do water resources? Same with um, aquatics. Um, but we do need to look at our community college, technical college, our high schools, and how do we build that new pathway and make sure that as we build that pathway, it's lining up with the jobs that we're also creating. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. There's much more to talk about. Hopefully, we'll be able to stick around for afterwards. Uh, I want to, if you can stay with I'd the panel, to. we'd like to thank bring you. out the rest of the panel now, if we could, uh, probably to dovetail on what we've been talking about in particular with transitioning economies and retraining workers. So I guess we'll... Swap a route here. Hi. Oh. How are you? Oh. You're good. Okay, so hoping you guys all have programs, so I'll keep the introductions brief. But um, we're joined on the stage by uh, Darren Perry. He's the chairman of the uh, Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation here in Idaho. As he tells me, the very southeast corner, the farthest corner of Idaho. Um, and uh, we'll start with Darren, and then we'll kind of go around quickly, and then hopefully get time, uh, some time for questions. But Darren, we were just talking briefly at backstage when we met. Um, you know, we've been talking uh, with Hillary just now about looking forward, how to um, uh, how to revive uh, rural economies. But you have a, a quite often, maybe even suppressed perspective, too suppressed. That is like, we need to be looking to our past to figure out how to best manage the land for the future. Absolutely, and, and thank you for having me, by the way. An old tribal elder nudged me one day when we were at a conference similar to this and said, boy, these white people have screwed things up. <laughs> <laughs> And it, made me, and it made me laugh. 
That's but, the end of his talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wondered how that would go over here. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, we live in a, the 21st century, we live in a time of extraordinary contradictions. Even when we have the answer and we see the problem, we still have a hard time getting it together and solving it. And, and my whole thing is ancient tribal cultures lived in this land for thousands of years with not very many problems when it comes to the environment. And so, to me, the only way we're really going to make a difference in the future is, is if we have the ability to look into the past and learn from the past, learn from past mistakes and learn from past indigenous cultures. Columbus, when he arrived to America, didn't arrive to an untamed wilderness, as some have recorded. <laughs> He arrived to a land that had been carefully maintained by indigenous land practices for thousands of years. They were gatherers. They needed to make sure that they had enough going forward and so never harvesting more than they needed and making sure the land had time to rest in certain years. And so uh, I believe that the only real true path forward for all of us is to be able to look back at some of those indigenous cultures that have uh, that survived, survived happily for thousands of years and, and look at some of their best practices and what can we do with that, those resources that we have. We have them, we're here, we're still a thriving community, our governments are still strong and I think we have a lot to offer uh, a sick world that we live in today. Mm -hmm. And M Emily Niehaus is the mayor of Moab, Utah um, and um, relatively recently, a year and a half, correct? So uh, is maybe one of those communities that is wrestling with this very thing. Moab was a traditional natural resource economy, 50s and 60s, that went belly up, then it moved to uh, reinvention, reinvent itself as a tourism economy. Now you have so much tourism and so many pressures on the land, where do you go forward? Where does, where does Moab go next? How do you diversify that economy after you Tried to re-diverse. I guess you re-diverse. That's the right <laughs> How question. How do we uh, shake it up? Well, um, uh, I liked what you said about learning from the past. And so what launched me to being mayor was that I was a founder of a nonprofit um, community rebuilds, building um, affordable, energy efficient straw bale homes mm -hmm. with low income families through a student education program. And so using adobe and, and mm -hmm. wood to build homes, um, adobe floors, um, uh, passive solar, so all of those um, uh, original building techniques into the program. Um, but uh, when I think of rural resilience, I like to say rural renaissance because we have an opportunity um, to look at our rural communities and um, reinvent um, what rural means. Um, it, it's the place where we are um, harvesting um, so much to fuel the urban areas and we need to protect the, the farmland and we need to um, reconsider energy development. And so um, when I think of economic diversification and I think of Moab exploding with tourism, um, I think of preserving farmland and I think of higher density housing and, and those are things that as a mayor are complicated uh, shifts, um, but, but important to do as the, as the community grows. Well, and John Piotti uh, is next uh, on our panel, American Farmland Trust. He's the president and CEO, but also uh, originally from Maine, right? So what um, Emily is just talking about there is something that is not unique to Moab, although it may be a little bit more amplified in Moab, but this mm -hmm. pressure to uh, have both, mm -hmm. have that rural uh, feeling and lifestyle, but in a place like Moab, um, the housing crisis is acute. Uh, there's pressure on the land to develop more. Can you have both? And are we talking about kind of two different things? I think there's, there's two different kinds of rural America. And 
One is to places like Moab or coastal Maine, mm -hmm. but in Maine you go inland an hour and it's a different world. It doesn't look like the photos from an LL Bean catalog anymore. <laughs> exactly, like, we just head yeah. right over the mountains here to the <laughs> same same thing border. here. Sure, Sun That's Valley is different. one thing. You go over yeah. the next valley, it's a it's a different world. Uh, and there's two kinds of rural America, and they each have challenges. They're different kind of challenges. Here, it might be uh, land pressures. It might be housing issues. It might be development run amok. Um, in other places, they're, they'll take any kind of development they can get mm -hmm. because they're, they're so desperate, which isn't the right route either. And I work with, with farmers across the country, and if you look at the heartland of America, I mean, this is, much of it is dying economically. And it's dying because of um, what has happened with farming um, over the last 50 years. Someone who was farming 160 acres, their son or grandson is now farming 3,000 acres. And that means there's you know, 1 20th of the farmers there, which means there's 1 20th of the vibrancy. Schools close, um, stores don't have customers, and it becomes this downward spiral. But I'm convinced that you can't have sustainable rural development without sustainable ag. And we can turn that around. We can, we're not going to turn back the clock and have that 3,000 acre farm be another, be a 160 acre farm. But the next parcel of 160 acres that come up could be something different and vibrant that could itself employ 20 people because it's doing a higher value crop, it has value added, it has processing, or something like that. So I think, I think farming is a big part of the answer. It's one of the mm -hmm. few things that is literally grounded and that we can build a sustainable rural economy around. So um, you guys are making my job easy with transitions here. So we also have <laughs> Dr. Burton Webb on the stage, who is president of the University of Pikeville. Um, and we're talking about an area of the country, we're pivoting to an area of the country that I think a lot of people um, associate with rural, you know, especially uh, on our East Coast-based centric media. Um, mm -hmm. But you're in a community that uh, is and was heavily dependent on coal. Uh, we don't need to talk about um, what's going on in the coal market, uh, what the politicians are saying versus the realities. But as head of a, of a university, what role, and what are you guys doing to prepare for that transition? Yeah, that, that's really a great question because it, it strikes to the heart of what we're doing, I, I think, nationwide in, in the answer as we transition from an economy of the production of things toward an economy that is really dependent upon great ideas. And so, you know, for, for more than a century, Eastern Kentucky provided all of the coal that was necessary for the automotive industry. We won World War II in large measure because of the coal that was produced and dug out of the hills of Eastern Kentucky. And so my ancestors uh, were born and raised there. In fact, my great-grandfather was a farmer in Eastern Kentucky, he owned a little subsistence farm, and lived there very happily for about 50 years. But as the land became more valuable for coal, much of that land was, was lost. And so he ended up moving, and, and I was raised in Michigan on a farm instead of in, uh, in eastern Kentucky. Mm -hmm. But you know, as we pivot away from that kind of economy, we don't want to lose the idea that eastern Kentucky can still be a great resource for energy. But the energy is going to be very different. The coal that we have remaining, we, we have enormous reserves, but they're very deep and they're very hard to get to, and it's cost prohibitive. And now we're at a place in the world where mining that coal is deleterious to the environment. Mm -hmm. So moving in that direction is not the right direction. So let me tell you just briefly about a, a friend of mine. He serves on my board. His name's Lynn Parrish. Lynn understood this conundrum and said, you know, coal miners are smart guys. Most of these people could be mechanical engineers if they had had the opportunity to go to school. What if we bring them in and put them through a 12-week training program and teach them how to code for computers? And so he did that. He, he found someone to teach Python, a great language for internet programming, to coal miners. And in 12 weeks, they trained them, and now they're selling apps online all over the place. They've got clients on the east and west coast, and they're doing great things. So moving from a mining economy to a knowledge economy is the precise fulcrum where a place like a higher education institution can exert the greatest pressure. And so we've done that. We're a small private liberal arts college, 2,500 uh, students who attend where we are. 
But we've diversified and now have uh, an enormous healthcare program. We have a nursing school that has about 160 students in it, a medical school that has 500 students in it, 1.6 million patients who used to be in underserved counties in Appalachia are now served by our alumni. And we're very, very proud of that. We've been in existence for 22 years and thriving in that area. And we just started four years ago an optometry college that will graduate our first optometrist in 2020. Great year to be an optometrist. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> I, I knew it would be wonderful. So it's just a great year to do that. And uh, the reason we did that is because we discovered that Owsley County, which is two counties away from us, has the highest rate of preventable blindness in the nation. Gosh, what better way to fix that than to bring a whole group of bright, energetic young people who are interested in finding real solutions for glaucoma to an area where glaucoma is rampant. Mm -hmm. What a great way to do that. So we work very hard with local businesses and, and the, the government and other things to be able to pull folks back in. There's a huge exodus from Appalachia like there is from so much of rural America. And we do everything in our power to bring people back because it is a great place to live. The mountains are gorgeous. You know, we have wonderful natural resources around us, and we've got trails and rivers and all kinds of things to do. So how do we get that back? And, and it really focuses on the role that education can play in creating that diverse knowledge economy in a place that's been left behind in the knowledge economy. Uh, Chairman Perry, anything to say on that? Because as I hear that, that's a little bit more shifting to what you were advocating for, as in moving more towards, well, I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but more towards the knowledge economy than the traditional extraction economy may have less impacts on public lands or lands. No, absolutely. That's exactly, I wanted to applaud while you were talking. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, and, and one thing for my tribal, the, the people that I, that I serve, uh, it's really important to us that uh, the and I tell them all the time, the most successful Native Americans today are those who can best balance culture, the old ways, and change. Mm -hmm. And then being able to be smart enough and educate ourselves enough to, to when we see things that make difference. Uh, we're not ever going back to the old ways. I understand that. And I'm not advocating for that. But we need to be educated enough to when things come about and we can educate our kids and make a difference in, in, a, in, a, way, in a modern way that we make sure our kids are able to do that and are prepared to do that. Mm -hmm. We're, Hillary, do you want to chime yeah, in? Yeah, the one thing I would, so I think we need to be thinking about our economies and our communities in a sense of different strokes for different folks, mm -hmm. okay? Um, I think we, we keep moving and pivoting like, okay, now we're a technology sector. And no, now we're gonna swing this way. And the reality is, I talked about those students that we're now training 25, kids a year in high school, active learning on a forest that belonged to the school that wasn't being managed, right, at all. And when I asked those kids, why, why did you sign up for this class? And they said, it is so great to be outside mm -hmm. and learning. Mm -hmm. Now, I have three boys. I raised them on the farm. They had to milk the goats. They had to butcher the chickens and the pigs. Mm -hmm. and they had to gather the eggs. And one's working in New York City now for Morgan Stanley. <laughs> the other one's coding at 16, a new algorithm based on Warren Buffett's penny stock theory. Uh -huh. And the third one's got an LA modeling and acting agent. So I clearly was trying to go a certain route and they all pivoted the other way, okay? But the fact is, Rebe Not, youth rebellion. Yeah. I know, youth rebellion. <laughs> they will come back to the farm. I believe it. But the reality is everyone is different. Right. And we need all of these sectors yes. for all different reasons, especially apps that are helping us yeah. farm and save our energy and our mm -hmm. water better. Mm -hmm. And so what I would urge is that we think about that we need to be creating programs at all different levels for the different types of people we have and what they love to do. Um, and then I would also think, you know, when we think about agriculture, right, in the context of like extraction or like, we know that everybody's gonna need food. So one thing that everybody needs besides water, right? And we've got to be ensuring that we're producing food that is long-term sustainable as we see climate change happening. As we see farmers, one of the things I see in our role is I look out on our lands that we manage, the million acres of agricultural land, and I'll say, well, who is, owns that land over there? Mm. Highly being, high product, ConAgra. Mm. Who over here? Well, that's a Mormon family that's buying right. up at an unbelievable rate in Washington State. And right. I could go on like that. Yep. We bring in land, mm -hmm. and because we take the cost of that land out, much yep. like your organization, yep. we make it more available yep. for more farmers who couldn't 
exactly afford it in this kind of market. The other thing that we should be looking at is adding things on, additive economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. So let's look at clean energy, mm -hmm. right? We are now, to have done 21 wind leases generating about 150 megawatts a year. Just signed our first two solar leases. I got 33 in the pipeline. Um, largest solar farms in Washington state um, that will now be producing, just the two alone, over 500 megawatts a year. Our lands are directly adjacent to farmers. Mm -hmm. They're now able to add additional money and revenue onto their their own farming and make it additive. So when farming industry goes, you know, right, the sector does this, mm -hmm. they are still able to keep farming and hold that land in agriculture mm -hmm. while also helping solve our energy crisis. You talk about different strokes for different folks. So like. Um, during the Obama administration, to some extent the Clinton administration, at least in the West, the push was recreation economy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there's tension around that in some mm -hmm. communities, perhaps Moab included. Um, did Moab. we go to, yeah, did we, <laughs> did we go too far pushing only that and did we alienate some other economies? Or alienate or, or miss <coughs> some other opportunities or are we missing some other opportunities? Because recreation jobs don't tend to pay although they are increasing, don't tend to pay as well as those coal jobs, as those timber jobs did, or those mill jobs did, as a whole. So any, any healthy grouping has diversity. Right. And so any one particular industry, um, so when Moab was uranium um, booming community, when the boom went bust, the bottom dropped out, and then it was like, oh, okay, well, let's look at this tourism thing, and all the leaders came together, and now we've got the tourism, and so it is our job um, as community leaders and I to hear, diversify. And I hear, I don't want to be the next Moab all over Utah, right? Oh, well, they're just, they say that, but then they call the state and say, hey, Vicki Varela with the tourism office, can we get some money to advertise for tourism, so... Um, but, but I want to make another um, a, a, a point to add on to what you were saying. Um, where are the millennials that are going to move back? Where are they going to live? Mm -hmm. So I want to just throw out the case for um, housing, mm -hmm. um, creative housing. So there was a slide yesterday that showed um, the classic um, rural, single family, subdivision model of housing. And we need to end that. Yep. We have to, like, and, and quickly. Mm -hmm. And so um, here's what's exciting about being mayor. I get to appoint planning commission members. Um, I get to be part of this land use conversation where we get to redraw the map and say what, what gets built where. But like when I think of your kids, LA, New York, mm -hmm. and you say they, they might move home, where are they gonna live? They don't wanna live in a farmhouse. Mm -hmm but they wanna live in something that's like, maybe got a bar and like a, an incubator, like a little workspace and, and an apartment that's like efficient and like a place to store their mountain bikes mm -hmm. or their hiking, just skiing, whatever um, stuff that they have because rural is, you know, most rural communities have some type of recreation. And so there's a big case for us to look at housing and then with that housing we can tie in all of these other groovy things that um, that we want to see um, reemerge in, in rural America, I think. If I could just, rural America is not just one monolithic thing; it's many right, things, right? Right. Right. If I could just chime in on that, I th I think land use issues and rethinking planning and all that is so is so critical, not only for the reasons you mentioned, but um, it, it's not just about the people; it's also about the land, and. Farmland is, is one of those critical things where those pieces come together. So you're right. You need to create the right kind of housing to potentially get Hillary's kids excited about coming back. <laughs> yeah. But as, Hil promise, yeah. as, Hillary, <laughs> as Hillary was saying, you also need to create the right situation for farmers, the right. next yeah. generation of farmers. Yeah. And as I noted yesterday and, and briefly in my, in my presentation, one of the best ways to make land affordable for farmers, mm -hmm. it's part of what you do, is if that land is permanently protected um, through an easement or through some state involvement, it changes the economics completely. Right. There are people who want to farm. There are people who want to go into rural areas and farm. They just have bar huge barriers to entry. And the biggest one is cost. And yep. the biggest part of that cost is the cost of land. Yep. 
But if you have people <clears throat> paying for land at its farm value rather than its development value, which is what an easement does, it changes the whole economics. And it doesn't work everywhere. It doesn't work in rural Nebraska because there are the costs of the land. Whether it has an easement on it or not is going to be pretty similar. Right. But it sure would make a difference where you live or where you live. Mm -hmm. And so we need to think of that as part of the whole land use analysis. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways we're addressing this is, is fascinating because, of course, where we are, there really is no flat land mm -hmm. for much of anything unless you're up on the top of an abandoned strip mine, which frankly has not been reclaimed in a way that is really usable for farming. I'm, we're starting to put solar farms up there, but that's about all we can do. Mm -hmm. So we've partnered with a local company who's been here a couple of times, App Harvest. Mm -hmm. Uh, App Harvest was ultimately not able to build in Pikeville because that land was too unstable. So they moved about 30 minutes away and they're building a 60 acre complex in Moorhead, Kentucky. That's still in Appalachia and it's still considered by the people who live in our area as, as being part of them, as part of who they are, which is a big deal in rural America. So with App Harvest, we went into one of the local high, sp high schools that's about 10 miles away from our campus and we said, we'd like to teach you container farming. We, we're not really sure how much interest there is, but we're gonna, we're gonna partner together to buy the container farm. We'll put it out there at the school. We'll bring a teacher in who's gonna teach. Let's see if we can recruit. We'd love to have eight students. 60 students signed up. Mm -hmm. We had to turn away 40 of them. Uh, no, sorry, 20. We had 40 who finished the program. These students are so excited about high-tech agriculture. They're coming to the University of Pikeville now and saying, when are we going to start our own greenhouse program here at the university? Mm. And I'm saying, next year, because <laughs> y'all are juniors, and I need you to graduate and start next year. So we're now partnering with App Harvest and with the USDA and some others to, to develop a high-tech ag research center on our mm. campus, which we think is a way to really expand and produce food locally there in Appalachia. We can eliminate the food desert that we have there. But more yes. than that, we're within an eight-hour drive of New York City, Washington, D.C., and Atlanta. And we can provide a product that all of those areas will need that doesn't come on a truck from Mexico or Southern California, but comes right from Central Appalachia. Mm -hmm. And so this is, the, this is the idea economy, right? Mm -hmm. This is where someone comes up with an idea. It doesn't have to be programming. It can be something else. And and then leverage that into something that's really great. And ag is one of those things. Absolutely. So, uh, rural America is very diverse. Uh, in the West, it's eight hours to the next city. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, uh, we have time for one or two questions, I think. I think there are some people, if, if, if you have a question, um, I don't know if I, yep, there's one right there. There's a microphone, too. I think people are. Got you. This would be for Dr. Webb and, and Chairman Perry. One of the things, bits of infrastructure you have to have for a knowledge economy in, in rural areas is access to the inter internet, is broadband. Right. How do you have access in Pikeville? Do you have access on your reservation? If so, how? If not, how are you going to get it? We have access in Pikeville because we have a major hospital. So let me back up and, and start by saying uh, Central Appalachia is where you will find the deep purple on every healthcare indicator map in the United States. Mm -hmm. And, and by that, I mean we have the worst outcomes everywhere. If you look at life expectancy in Colorado or Idaho and compare that to life expectancy in Pikeville, Kentucky, we're 12 years less. Uh, and it's because of a variety of things. So when you have a situation like that where the economy is very depressed and, and you have problems, hospitals grow. So we have a really good private hospital. We have a university that needs and requires broadband. So we actually have uh, two or three major pipelines that come in and bring us, I think it's three or four terabit service. So we've got high tech service here. But if you go from Pikeville and drive up the holler, it's Chloe Creek, that's what we call every hill and valley in, in Eastern <laughs> Kentucky. Drive up the holler to the head of the holler, that's the top where it drops down into the next one. I know, explaining uh, hillbilly terminology. Um, if you do that, you get to the head of the holler, and it's still dial-up. Mm. Y'all remember dial-up? <laughs> yeah, that, that's it. And, and so we do have a problem. There is, right now, a program going on in our state that is bringing broadband into all of Appalachia. They're building a ring that will come down uh, through Hazard and down through Whitesburg and then up to Pikeville and then on up to Paintsville. And when that happens, when that ring is closed, we will have broadband throughout Appalachia. What we won't have is last mile. 
Now, this goes back to the telephone days. Yeah. Remember the yeah. telephone mm -hmm. days when Appalachia and the West and the rural parts of the Midwest didn't have telephone service? And the government said to all the telephone companies, yeah, you're going to build it. We're going to require it. If you want to be licensed to operate in the United States, you have to get to every house. We don't have that for internet because most of the United States has broadband internet from four providers. Mm. And so the United States looks at us and says, well, why don't you have it? Well, gosh, you must be lazy. Maybe that's why you don't have it. So we need something like the, the Telephone and Telegraph Act of, what was it, 1938, I think, uh, to come back in for the internet. That would get internet into all of these rural places. And investment dollars into that last businesses that are doing that last mile with um, yes. cell. Mm -hmm. and, oh. No, the only thing I was going to add to that, the hauler, the worst part, mm -hmm. is where they put the Native Americans. Yeah. <laughs> That's where they moved us, to the most rural, rural, terrible lands there are. That's right. And, and let me just speak in one second to some of the nations, the tribal nations have internet and are thriving, and there are some who don't. And we're working hard every day to make sure that those are, that are out on the West Desert in Nevada uh, have access to that, and, and the state governments are really working with us to do that. Good. I'll just add, and because I know there's a question, one of the things we're always trying to do is look at all the sort of problems in an area and then link them up with solutions, because oftentimes, so for example in broadband, I we have fire camps in many of these rural areas <coughs> because that's where our wildfires are, and we set up our camps, and so we have a challenge of our firefighters even being able to communicate with each other. So what we've been doing in our state is looking at identifying those fire camps and saying, how do we get that broadband there and then link it up to the schools and link it up to the small businesses and the libraries and the communities so we're bringing more than a solution for our own challenge, but something that's much more of a larger solution for that community. Yeah. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Is there one more question? Do we have another one? Yeah. In the back. Yep. Is it on? No. Maybe just talk loud. I don't know. <laughs> just holla. I will. <laughs> Ooh, somebody had to say it. <laughs> How about now? There you go. Just holler and things happen. I, will. <laughs> I used to live in a holler, by the way. Uh, so I, I just wanted to make two points. I think most of this forum has been about resilience in a climate context. But I think what this panel illustrates, that regardless of whether the challenge is climate, dealing with uh, the outfall from the spotted owl decisions that were made in the, in the 90s, et cetera. The key is communities that have the capacity and the will to work together to formulate their own solutions. In fact, the, the foundation, Kettering Foundation did a big study about what makes democracy work, and this was the conclusion. It was this capacity of communities to find solutions. One point I want to make, since um, I'm Jim Lyons, and I was responsible for implementing the Spotted Owl strategy. <laughs> A point I want to make is that um, that tragedy was a function of communities that resisted change over a long period of time, and frankly elected officials, many of whom served on the Appropriations Committee, who had the capacity to circumvent laws by uh, writing legislation to do so. So things came hard and fast to those communities in, in unfortunate way. But what doesn't get talked about was <coughs> that there was a plan to help those communities in transition. A billion dollars was spent in that region from 1995 uh, to 2000. And it was developed in collaboration with the states, with local authorities, and others. And I think much of the rapid transition that occurred in many communities was a function of that collaboration. And the point I'm trying to get to is that we need to look at these experiences and see what worked. And I think Hillary made this point very, very well. Um, it takes a partnership and a collaboration between public agencies, local communities, but it takes engagement with those communities to help them see the future, as Dr. Webb just described, and, and then capitalize on the assets and resources that government and others can bring together to help achieve those outcomes. And I think that did occur there. The communities that did not come out the other end positive in many respects just simply decided, we don't want your help. We don't really give a damn what you, what you offer us because you killed us off. And that's really been unfortunate because some of those communities still exist and in some of those communities that would just as soon leave the United States as a part of the problem. Is your question, if I could stop you really quick, is your question sense that like, is this possible, this transition without a major public investment? So, so here's, I'm just, because I, here's what I know, okay? 
We will not make any progress on building resilience and supporting resilience, whether it's in the urban or the rural, without relationships, without building a sense of trust and relationship, okay? Um, and, I, and I can use this as an example in our work on climate resilience, okay? We're doing a climate adaption plan for the entire state now because all six million acres of our land, we have done a climate risk assessment and we know sea level rise, ocean acidification, drought, we're already facing it. So what we've started doing is going into a community that frankly would never, ever put it on their headlines, climate change exists. They would be the ones that would say, oh no, no, largely because there isn't that sense of comfort yet for them to be able to do it politically. We went into those communities now and we're talking to them and they say, we already know it's a problem. Will you please help us? Here are the things we want you to work on first and to tackle first. Forest health, wildfire, drought, soil nutrient depletion, right? We started from a lens of relationship building and starting to build a layer of trust. Now it takes an enormous amount of work, especially as we're going back in the context, let's look at your community, right? How many years of mistrust, right, abuse, in, right, mm -hmm. that, it takes time to build that. But if we don't start now, we will not create any change. If we continue to try to get progress on the ground through headlines and name calling and division, we will continue to fail ourselves, our children, the next generation, rural communities and urban communities alike. We have to start from a context of relationship and trust building and working together for a common outcome. And I believe we can get there. 10 sure, seconds, here. as we say in radio, uh, 10 seconds. I just want to say that the last presidential election was um, uh, decided by rural voters. And uh, rural needs a lot of attention right now. And there are positive ways that we can <clears throat> provide attention to rural communities, education, broadband, um, uh, and um, and a, a resurgence of agriculture in a way that's like bringing millennials together, like all of those things, like that is important work that we do right now is this, um, and I said, you know, not just resilience, but renaissance, like let's really. So could I just say, you know, okay, I think I'm, yeah, I'm so getting just, the flag here. So I, I want to thank the panel um, <laughs> and uh, there'll be more time to talk, I think during lunch. Um, so appreciate uh, your attention and uh, let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you.